My firm, Charles C. Durable Incorporated, was established in 1998. In addition to commercial surveys, we have inspected a variety of historic vessels. What follows is a sampling of such surveys. We also conduct research and produce drawings needed to recreate missing components. When required, we have partnered with the PE Associate to collaborate on various projects. This is a manually driven bilge pump patented in 1868, and the drawings made from information contained within the patent. It's a double acting pump, and um, there is a cylinder with the piston and the discharge port and pipes running down into the bilges. Uh, the pump is operated uh, uh, through flywheels and a crankshaft. As shown in this uh, slide from a uh, farm vessel, from a restored farm vessel. Um, all these pump parts have been designed and drawn and it remains to 3D print a quarter scale model to refine its operation. <clears throat> it goes without saying that the same safety precautions apply for inspecting a historic vessel as for one in commercial service. Inspection items requiring close scrutiny are extreme weathering of the hull, along the water line, fendering systems, ventilation, and good housekeeping. The condition of the water line plating is usually a good indicator of the vessel's hauling schedule. This particular vessel has not been out for about 20 years. Regular monitoring of a hull's electrical potential and that of the surrounding pier structures is needed to implement procedures that will protect the vessel from galvanic activity. Continuous galvanic action leads to corrosion damage resulting in dangerous conditions and prohibitively expensive repairs. And here we have some hold conditions in the side shell. These were blown in by a pressure wash as soon as the uh, vessel was raised. A historic vessel is usually at the same trim throughout her inactive life, and this is important to note at the start of inspection. The vessel can constantly down by the stern, for example, will collect dirt and debris that will accumulate in the aft end of compartments piling up against transverse floors and bulkheads. And it's evident that these are areas that are heavily corroded uh, with some action going on under the debris. Some vessels remain afloat by being completely doubled. Uh, this particular vessel is doubled from about the port, or the straight below the port, port lights down to the keel. The double plating keeps the vessel afloat with rampant damage to plating and internal framing proceeds unabated. And here we have uh, interior with some collapsed floors. Failed port light gaskets and uncorrected deck leaks allow rainwater to permeate the interior. The constantly wet environment attacks already poor coatings on the hull structure. In wooden vessels with poorly maintained and dried out topsides, heavy snow accumulating on deck, in addition to melting and leaking below, reduces freeboard and increases the risk of water reaching an open planking seam, resulting in flooding. Clean, dry air replenished on a regular cycle is vital in keeping the interior of the vessel fresh. The satisfactory ventilation system should be sized to exchange the volume of air in the hull about every 30 minutes. Simple, high-volume, agricultural-type exhaust fans work well, especially in vessels with open holes. The exhaust fan mounted on a vertical trunk leading from the weather deck to about three feet above the keel draws air down through and out the vessel. Passive dehumidification, such as desk and canisters, can be used to good effect in confined spaces such as fore and after peaks. The ally of good ventilation is good housekeeping. Supplies, equipment, and materials should be stowed off the ship to keep internal areas clear, making routine inspection and cleaning a much easier task. While ample ventilation and good housekeeping are paramount, these fundamental practices are frequently put on the back burner in favor of more ambitious and visible projects. 
but neglecting the basics ensures costly and complex repairs, and if these are deferred, an uncontrolled deterioration of the vessel takes place. Fendering should be kept clear of the waterline to avoid chafing rivet points and prevent damage to wooden hull planking. Poor fendering removes protective coatings, putting the hull in direct contact with the surrounding waters. The vessel should also be turned annually to allow the hull to weather. Example and effects of poor fendering practice and galvanic action. In this particular case here, you can see all these rivets have been severely damaged. These were removed and will be replaced um, with countersunk bolts, machine countersunk bolts. Many vessels we inspect are riveted or combined welded and riveted hull structures, so familiarity with riveted construction is essential. The general types of rivets used in the Navy in 1915. Now these are the forged heads on the rivets and these are the, uh, the closed or the driven points um, that's performed when the vessel is being built. Rivet holes in plates less than one inch thick were punched while holes in larger plates were drilled. Punched holes are reamed to ensure alignment and to remove material made drill by punching. Prior to riveting plates and members together, they are firmly bolted up so the fanging surfaces are in complete contact. In naval construction, every hole receives a bolt. Drawing the plates together by closing rivets is poor practice and results in a leaking joint that requires re-riveting or filling the defective seam with red lead paste applied under pressure through a tapped hole in the plate lap. Rivets were closed either hydraulically, pneumatically, or manually with riveting hammers. Hydraulic riveting used for larger diameter rivets closed the hot rivet in one convulsive squeeze, better staving up or filling the holes in the plates. And this particular hydraulic riveter, the, the piston that closes the rivet is at the bottom of the claw. Portable hydraulic riveters that work on a sheer strength of a large vessel. Oops. Riveting of bottom longitudinal assembly. Uh, in this view, the assembly is laid horizontally so the rivet, so the hydraulic rivet can reach reach all the points in, in the uh, in the uh, web of the uh, unit. Uh, in this particular riveter, the uh, the piston is at this end, and this is the hinge fulcrum with the driving points at the end of claws. The, the portable hydraulic riveter was invented by mechanical engineer Ralph Tridell in 1871 and first used in bridge building. Closing rivets with pneumatic hammers to great care as the points could get battered up if heat was lost before the rivet shank fully, fully filled the holes in the plates. Rivets closed pneumatically in the latter stages of World War I suffered from inferior workmanship due to increased production speeds the cross-section of some poorly fitted up plate. You can see the gaps and the misalignment. This is from 1926 uh, name publication. Manually closing rivets with rivet hammers. Two men closed one rivet with alternating blows and the point chipped flush with a chisel. The seam laps and butts of riveted shell plates are mechanically caulked, that is one plate is upset against its partner rendering the seam watertight. Toes of connecting angles such as bulkhead to shell bounding bars are also caulked as are other structural members required to be watertight. Here you can see the first cut along with the uh, chisel. The chisel is flipped over and reversed and drawn the other way and this is the point that actually renders the, the seam watertight. An example of caulk seams in the bottom shell of the vessel. This is a lap plate. Where you can just see the edges of the, of the caulking along the plates. And here is a, a tapered liner that takes up the space between the, the lap and the uh, inside straight. Caulking the seam lap with the pneumatic chisel. 
Checking for separation in garbage straight, the bar kill caulk seam with a mirror. During survey, the caulk seams are checked visually, and any separation or displacement is measured with a feeler gauge. Seams that show extensive application of epoxy filler are suspect and should be carefully checked on both sides of the seam to note if the seam is further compromised or if there is any sign of internal weepage. If previous surveys are available, they should be reviewed to uncover when and why the filler was applied. Corrosion activity and the estimated percentage of wastage on rivet points are noted during inspection. United States Coast Guard navigation and vessel circulars prior to 2001 serve as important guides for inspecting a riveted hull. Steel and wrought iron rivets present corrosion damage differently as shown in the scan page from a 1926 name publication. As can be seen, the steel rivet point at left presents a honeycomb appearance while wastage in the wrought iron rivet appears more uniform. Wrought iron rivets were used well into the 20th century. Although of lower tensile strength than steel rivets, they held heat better and made a more uniform joint when driven with manual rivet hammers. The act of closing steel rivets and the resulting heat scale on the surface of the point makes them somewhat anodic to the plates they are joining, and steel rivet point corrosion became a serious problem with the increased use of steel rivets. This is less so with wrought iron rivets and is attributed to the lower carbon content and elevated percentage of slag held within high quality wrought iron. To better understand the behavior of a riveted joint within a plated structure and to measure rivet slip, an non-elastic, non-recoverable dislocation in a rivet joint, samples of riveted connections were tested in 300,000 pound hydraulic machines in the 1920s. Samples were fitted with strain gauges, primed with aluminum paint, and given a top coat of brittle varnish. And here we have the, the sample at right. This is a 15-pound plate, 15-pound plate, a 10-pound strap, and on the opposite side, a 7.5-pound uh, scalp butt strap. Crack patterns in the brittle varnish were recorded with each 25,000-pound increase in load and the movement of the test plates measured with the Ames dial indicator fitted with a special tapered pin inserted in test holes. And here we have the Ames, Ames dial indicator. And you can just see the tapered point at the other end of the, uh, of the indicator. In a wooden vessel, fungal decay is the primary cause of deterioration. One may even say that a wooden boat begins to decay while on the building waves. The causes of decay are varied. A felled tree lying in the ground before milling can yield poor material. New growth or green timbers, insect infestation, <coughs> structural defects in the grain, workmanship, and the usual suspects, lack of ventilation, lack of maintenance, and poor housekeeping. However, incipient decay in timbers is insidious and can be difficult to detect. One method is to culture core samples of the various timbers prior to construction to determine if or what type of fungus is present. This is an example of, heavy, of a heavy engine hatch timber having brown rot. Brown rot is caused by an organism that spreads rapidly from the substructure of the timber. The characteristics of brown rot are cubical or rectangular sections which can be made out that easily collapse upon a manual pick test inspection. While the suspect timber may appear normal from the may appear normal and the coating is unaffected, the cellular fungus is working its way from the interior to the exterior of the timber, leaving in most cases a deceptive veneer of sound wood. Close visual inspection, pick tests, and tapping with a small mallet or cut-off broom handle that return a hollow sound from the timber can indicate if the member is structurally compromised. Bradley Murray, the machine's not working. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Fleet submarines. Surveys and trip and tow inspections were performed on fleet type submarines. Because of their round shapes, as shown by this midship section, 
Inspecting ballast in the fuel tanks is especially arduous. Here we have a section, a midship section, uh, in the way of a, of a fuel ballast tank, and here in the way of a bulkhead. You see the superstructure above with the control room and the conning tower above that. The so U-boat section being scrapped, and here you can see an alternate type of bracing between the outer hull and the inside pressure hull. The hull interior showing the outer shell and the pressure hull at left. Air flasks blowing for, uh, that are used to blow the ballast tanks are barely seen. These, I think, are 3,000 pound tanks, and this is a 600 pound air flask. This is the intervening space between the outer hull and the pressure hull. Trip and tow inspections included chalk testing watertight doors, searching out and inspecting open vent trunks and engine air intake diving valves, locating open bulkhead penetrations and checking propeller shaft glands. Sometimes corrosion damage to the hull in the way of outer torpedo tube doors is extensive. However, regardless of the condition of the outer doors, the inner doors must be inspected and made secure. Nineteenth century steam powered cruiser. This one of a kind vessel, the oldest steel warship afloat, was launched at the Union Iron Works in San Francisco in 1892. Designed as a twin screw protected cruiser, is powered by two triple expansion steam engines giving a top speed of about 22 knots. Shear is minimal, there's a long midship structure. The main battery was housed in two twin turrets, one forward and one aft, with secondary and tertiary batteries in superstructure and hull casemates. The design is a combination of American, English, and French practice of the day, and incorporated the first hydraulic steering gear machinery. The vessel of Tom Survey. This midship section, the side protection cofferdam system, you can see port and starboard here, extensively employed in Europe at the time, was incorporated into the hull to augment the armored protective deck. The, the enclosed cofferdam spaces were filled with compressed corn pit cellulose. The idea was that if the shell hit on the side shell, water coming into the coffer dam would slowly be stopped by the swelling of the cellulose. The protective deck would presumably deflect the projectile from the vitals and the ship would fly it on. Here's the interior of one of the coffer dams with the side shell. This is the interior longitudinal bulkhead in the coffer dam. This is the open port and this area was filled with the compressed cellulose. The underside of the protective deck. Because the protective deck was assembled from multiple layers of plate, a quilted rivet pattern was used to connect the individual layers of plates. The detail of the protective deck side shell connection, this is laminated plate, two layers of 20 pound plate, bounding bars, the protective deck, uh, deck beam, the protective deck itself, brackets of course, and uh, 20 pound side shell below that. Areas of severe corrosion and destruction of shell collating was most extensive in this area. The coffer dam was built to permit cleaning the side shell with the vessel afloat using the sponge jet system. You see the whole plating obviously and then the wasted rivet points from the upper and lower bounding bar. The sponge jet system for play preparation reuses the abrasive material up to 10 times, produces less dust, debris, and cleanup is much easier. The grid is encapsulated and filtered for reuse with the proper recycling equipment. The sponge jet system is also effective in partially removing chlorides from the steel, reducing cleaning time prior to coating. Recently, the Capitol Dome in Washington was prepared with the sponge jet system. This is the interior of the uh, same area. 
All the inserts were considered, but would have introduced stresses into the hull and required the removal of significant portions of the internal riveted connections and laminated topside plating strips. That would have caused more harm than good, and a more benign, non-corrosive, and effective method to treat the damaged plating was needed. The Anacon system. Anacon metal clad is a two-part, 100% solid polymer composite that is effective in repairing all types of fluid flow equipment and proved excellent in this application. The basic physical properties are compressive strength, 13,500 pounds per square inch, flexural strength, 8,500 PSI, and tensile strength, joining steel, joining two pieces of steel, 4,000 PSI. This is the first use of the sponge jet blasting and Anacon systems to arrest deterioration and preserve a historic vessel. It was applied in July of 2015 and appears completely stable and intact nearly two years later. Indications of corrosion damage can be subtle. Here is some hard to see distortion caused by pack rust expansion between the Bergen shell bounding bar and the side shell. Such corrosion is sometimes difficult to detect and harder to arrest. You see the side shell is actually being pushed out right along the edge of the bounding bar from the, uh, the bird deck. The side and bottom shell plating were extensively inspected from the protective deck to the keel and over 1,300 internal UT readings were taken. Prior to taking thickness readings, the plating is prepared by removing hard scale with a ball peen hammer and the area burnished with a wire wheel. A non-toxic water-soluble gel medium is applied to provide a good seal for the transducer. The signal strength is closely watched on the gauge screen and when maximum coupling is achieved, the measurement is read. The sound velocity of the UT gauge can be adjusted to read nearly any material. Now here the gauge is giving a reading of 244 on a nominal thickness on this bulkhead combing plate of 250. So as awful as this looks, there is actually some material left here. Quite a bit, actually. The UT readings in uh, starboard compartment A15. We have it frame 27. The nominal thickness of this plating is a half inch. And you see we have pretty good readings. 478, 486. We start getting a little thin up here by the protective deck bound the bar. Support side shell. Uh, in this vessel, the bilge keels were bolted to the hull. Very interesting arrangement. And here's another good reading, although the space doesn't appear to uh, show that. It's a reading of 436 on a nominal plating thickness of uh, 500. And a general view of the bilges showing the cement pumping layer. There were many spaces in this vessel that appeared nearly intact. Here's a side coal bunker showing good conditions. Now this red lead was applied in, apparently in the 1920s. Other spaces suffered greatly from leaks along the water line. And here we have the breech side shell on a coal bunker showing temporary sheet metal and foam back patches along the underside of the protective deck and away of the existing water line. This damage was caused by years of chafe from a cluster pile. Easily prevented. Areas under the main engines were difficult to reach. Typical corroded conditions in the way of engine foundations in the double bottom. We subcontracted an underwater engineering company to take several hundred additional UT gaugings on the bottom shell in areas that were inaccessible from the interior. In addition to the, uh, to the in the water inspection, we conducted a trip and troll, trip and tow survey, and dynamometer low tested 50% of the vessel's mooring points. During survey, an interesting device was seen. <clears throat> this ship may have the only existing Fessenden test telegraph oscillator. MIT reportedly had such a unit in its collection, but upon inquiry, this proved not to be so. By means of this electromagnetic machine operating a diaphragm in contact with seawater, telegraph messages could be sent by ships underway, and for short distances, speech, speech could be transmitted. Soundings could be taken and received nearly instantaneously. This device, developed by Canadian Reginald Fessenden, 
was an early active sonar unit that would detect an object's range and bearing. As a response to the loss of RMS Titanic in 1912, the British Board of Trade put out a request for inventors to develop an instrument to detect icebergs at long range. The first Fessenden oscillator was successfully tested off Miami in 1914. And here's a unit uh, as fitted on a submarine in the 1920s. Is the, um, while this warship didn't represent any single monumental innovation, it was the combination of features that makes her an exceptionally noteworthy vessel. The manner of her construction, powerful ordnance, high speed, hydraulic steering, and crew comforts of the day were all combined in a one-off design. No sister vessels were ever built. One hundred and seventy-five vessels of this rugged class were built during wartime. During the course of the project, it was seen that the quality of design and workmanship was impressive given the rough circumstances of the time. This class of destroyers is a good example of combined riveted welded construction with the mid-body riveted and welded and the fore and after bodies exclusively welded. There's a partial midship section of this vessel. You see the hull is mostly longitudinally framed with heavy, heavy, uh, heavy webs. Uh, this actually is a torpedo crane, but there's not much hull here. It's just pretty shallow. We were contacted by NAVC in 2012 to determine the condition of the riveted hull connections, and again in 2013 to oversee the hull work needed to safely refloat the vessel as Charlestown Dry Dock had to be cleared for restoration work to commence on USS Constitution. Close inspection was conducted on riveted connections, although no sophisticated means, such as impact hammer testing or, or radiographic methods were employed. Only one cork seam lap above the waterline was slightly displaced, but all others appeared uniformly sound. And here we have another example of a cork seam. Rivet points showed some local deterioration, but no slack rivets were detected by sounding with the blow peen hammer. The side shell plating was holed and well below allowable thickness in numerous areas. That's my little chisel hanging out of the hole there. Um, scoop condenser intakes were plated over. Welding repairs were tested with vacuum boxes. The chloride testing done prior to coating the hull were conducted. Many internal spaces were treated and coated as well. We had the good fortune to work with a proactive contractor and the vessel was successfully refloated in May of 2013. UT gauging was previously conducted on the vessel by another firm, but no gaugings were taken in the way of the keel or bilge blocks. NAFC requested such work and we conducted internal UT testing to determine the existing plating thicknesses in the way of the blocking. And here we have the center vertical keel in the way of the keel block. These are the readings on the uh, keel plate. Uh, it was given a nominal thickness of uh, 0.625. So the readings are certainly overall very good. Internal readings in the way of the bilge block. The longitudinal 5 in the after fire room. It strikes AB. We conducted a whole survey and partial mast inspection of this vessel. She was a three-masted bark built in 1936 as a sail training vessel. The hull has a sharp entry forward, a fine run aft. The vessel has an attractive shear sweep and dead rise is considerable. The pleasing tumble home is provided and in no way does the graceful hull appear slab sided. Double riveted joggle plating sounds. The plating is arranged in a combination of clinker and in and out strikes with double riveted joggle seam laps and welded butts throughout. Joggle plate edges permit the plates to lay flat against the frame, eliminating the need for plate liners as needed for unjoggled in and out plating system. In addition to the hull inspection, we consulted on UT gauging locations and conducted thickness testing on selected spars. Numerous 1936 butt wells showed wastage possibly from welding rod material not being homogeneous or the weld being anodic with the plate. Well, beads also appeared undersized for the weight of plate. Recommendations for this vessel included radiographic inspection of riveted connections and butt wells in the middle three fifths of the vessel's length, with particular attention paid to the garbage bills and shear strikes. 
Internal conditions appear good, as this riveted joint illustrates. The spars were riveted and welded construction, and here we have we're determining the rivet pattern prior to UT gauging. The wire standing rigging supporting the mast is well secured to the hull structure. Rigging terminal points show no unusual conditions, and overall the mast appears sound. Two four-masted barks. These similar ships represented the final standard design of the 20th century deep water wind jam. They're typical three island steel four-masted barks popular with ship owners of the day. Both the transversely framed riveted vessels made of Siemens Martin mild steel throughout, and both are about 3,000 gross tons. Masting and standing rigging is also of steel. We, conduct, we conducted hull and spar inspections for insurance purposes. The schedule of the port side UT readings. UT readings were taken along the waterline plating every five feet and to expose as much plating as possible. We performed the gauging during the time of low water when the vessel grounded, ex exposing more plate. The detail and condition of uh, the plate butt lap is an inside straight, outside straight, butt lap, and taper line. This vessel had a quantity of sand ballast and the side shell was UT gauged at the junction of the ballast and plating where dirt and debris collect. Internal location showing applied gel coupling, coupling prior to UT gauge and we have to remove some of this fiberglass insulation. There's the uh, gel prior to UT gauging. Masting and rigging were inspected visually and as data was not available, UT readings were taken to determine nominal plating thicknesses. The rigging was undersized but more than sufficient to support the bare poles. The UT readings showed that the replica spars were built from light plating and not intended to carry sail. This is a distorted four-yard truss, one of the several unsatisfactory conditions noted during the survey. Yet another concern, the adrift main yard truss pin. Recommendations were made and it was reported that the alarming mast fitting conditions were reinforced. However, no reinspection was requested to verify the soundness of the additions. The second vessel spent a very life beginning as a fast nitrate freighter operating from Europe to the coast of Chile. The vessel in ballast about 1931, the uh, broad white band, uh, the upper edge is the uh, load line, the deep load line which is carrying cargo and now she's in ballast at the light load line and she's underway. Midship section showing a line of cement, ballast and the air is inspected. She had approximately 800 tons of poured ballast as shown by the green line. Heavy pack rust. The side shell plating in the afterbody suffered extensive injury from pack rust expansion. Pack rust activity is the most sinister condition to be found in the fanning surfaces of a riveted structure. Confined scale expands and the resulting pressure will cause structural members to separate and riveted connections to fail. Now these are 8 inch channels, approximately 8 inch channels, and you can see the, the, the uh, flange on the channel along the side shell is completely distorted, and here is one, one released rivet on this frame. Uh, the plate liners are pretty much completely eaten up. Hold side shell in the way of a doubler. Side shell forward showing improved conditions. Suspect areas remain in the way of the cement ballast and the side shell. 1911 wire standing rigging was about 41 millimeters in diameter and it was in an advanced state of decay and entirely replaced. Local plating repairs were also performed with deteriorated portions of steel mass and yards. And here we have a renewed gang of standing rigging. Re rigging this vessel was the largest project of its type undertaken in the United States. A partial survey was conducted on lower mass and bowsprit with extensive UT readings taken in selected locations. 
While there were local areas of concern, overall conditions were found to be stable. And here we have the interior of the lower mass. There are three strikes of plating and three stiffeners, three angle stiffeners. And these are internal butt straps connecting these two plates. In some sections of the mass, they were, uh, uh, the red leg was actually quite intact. Wooden vessels. This vessel is a single screw, three masted auxiliary barkentine with timber spars throughout. The clipper stem and spike bowsprit are fitted. Shoe sweep is moderate yet graceful, and the long counter ends in a broad transit. The hull is moderately full forward with a long one aft. The hull is a transversely framed timber structure, frames of double saw and hard pine, and the four thick planking is laid fore and aft. Top timber repairs. The frames and pairs are fastened to each other, they're actually bolted through, and to the exterior planking and the internal ceiling, which you can just see beyond. No decay in, a, in adjacent timbers. Decay in hold planking was seen above and in way of the water line. Decay in way of the stern post here. The rotor stock was reportedly fractured and repaired, but the manner of repair, joining the fractured sections with the, with the short scarf, is not acceptable. Another point of concern was unsecured ballast in the hold. We recommended that the vessel remain alongside until suitable planking repairs could be made, a new rudder shipped, and the ballast secured. Once these items were accomplished, travel was restricted to inland waters under calm conditions. We were contracted to act as project manager for the 2006 rebuilding and Coast Guard certification of this 50-foot wooden tunnel built in Newtown Creek in 1930. After 76 years, the whole structure of this vessel is in a dangerous condition with extensive decay activity. The only sound areas were the keel, bottom framing system, engine bearers, and planking to about the turn of the bilge. Three wood species, white oak, Douglas fir, and yellow pine, were used in the original construction and for the rebuilding. Originally steam powered, the tug was converted to diesel in 1946. The vessel was used as a creek tug to tow barges from confined waters, such as Newtown Creek, to larger tugs waiting in the river to pick up the tow. This tug, the last of her type, had a long, useful life, and in her later years, towed scows from New York to Norfolk, Virginia, and worked in and around New York Harbor. This is the vessel when she arrived at the yard, uh, looking pretty forlorn. The deck house was removed, the engine, shafting, wheel, and rudder were unshipped and refurbished. The framing installation on the port side looking aft. Each frame is appropriately beveled to accept the exterior hull planking. Framing installation complete, view forward. A new stem and stern framing was also installed. As the vessel is fully framed and uh, new planks are being installed forward. And here between the main frames on the hull, you see individual cant frames that were fitted forward for, for towing alongside. Driving galvanized spikes and trunnels. Trunnels or tree nails are essentially dowels that are tightly fitted and driven to connect the oak planking, the framing, and the yellow pine ceiling. Once the trunnel is driven, a wedge is struck into each end, splitting the trunnel and locking it in place. Using wooden trunnels to fasten wooden planking and frames makes the assembly homogeneous and locally immune from the galvanic action and wood delignification that occurs between steel and oak. Here's the last hole plank going in. It's a deck view. This is a uh, 
swung laid deck. In other words, the, uh, each individual plank is forced out to the covering board, which is the large timber along the perimeter of the vessel. And all the planks are forced out individually until they, 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 they assume the shape of the, the plan of the hull and they all land on the king plank midships. The vessel completed with new systems, tankers, and fire suppression equipment. And there she's on the way from the yard. Upon completion, the vessel passed a simplified stability test and received her U.S. Coast Guard certificate of inspection to carry 12 passengers and two crew. This is one of the drawings submitted to the uh, the Coast Guard uh, uh, showing the scanners of the vessel, uh, the partial midship, se midship section and partial bulkhead section. Thank you, that's, that's about it. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure we have um, lots of questions, but um, I'm sure I'm I'm afraid afraid. <laughs> so the floor is open. Any questions? Yeah. It looked like it, it was corrugated pressure between the animals. Yeah, it's like a truss. Yeah. Yeah, it's a different but, but it was, method. Solid, was it solid plate up? Was it solid? Um, on or the... Or was it a different frame? Go back to the beginning. No, we don't, we don't see corrugations. We see corrugations. Limited use of corrugations, but I, I don't recall seeing that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right, this is an American boat. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. one before this one. Right, with the radial uh, yeah. struts. Yeah. And, and then the U-boat has got got a truss truss between the pressure hull and the the external hull. So those were trusses in every frame? Yes, yeah, yeah just about as... Uh, so instead of this system, this is an American boat, so instead of this system you would have a truss Essentially, between these frames, going right from the top all the way down to the floor. Yeah, different different methods. You know, they had round, you know, they had round uh, access hatches mm -hmm. between the frames, and we had sort of over over the water tight doors. And I did have another one. Looking at all that corrosion and whatever. When did you get to the point that you could walk on a vessel and see that? And not think like you wanted to turn around and get out as quick as you could. Happens every time. <laughs> 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 no, you know, you know, you see some pretty awful, awful conditions, and and uh, sort of the sad thing is that it, you know, is that the owners are generally uh, don't consider them to be dangerous because the vessel is afloat. So, but you know, it, sometimes. Uh, it's living on borrowed time. You, know, you saw that one vessel with the collapsed wars. I mean, that, that was riding on the W. It's always keeping it flowing. Any questions? Yeah. I know. I I I didn't ask any, all the owners if I could use the name of the So I, yeah, it was too difficult to get everybody to agree. So, I, but yeah, I mean, I, in this I mean, closed room, I'm okay. to see. But yeah, all those things. Particularly if you say good things about you. <laughs> Can you expand on any of the subject? Because we need another 10 minutes of uh, 15 phone. Oh, you do? Oh, okay. Yeah, so. Wow, I went through that pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, I, I, I have an unusual question. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have another question. Yeah, of way. course. Yeah. On the wooden vessel. Yeah. Um, I, this was some years, some years ago. Okay. Yeah, quite a few years ago. I took involvement with the, uh, the New York City Constitution. Yeah. In Boston, was matter, and it, it's happened every I don't know if it's uh, 80 years or whatever. That's the most significant uh -huh. uh, And uh, there was an interest in a fix, and 
And I happened to be, uh, and she was a similar training you had with the large transverse friends. I think they were so large they touched each other. Yeah. But I was in uh, Greenwich in, uh, uh, in England, and uh, I visited the Cuddy Sard Museum at that time in San Francisco. And uh, first I was interested in the Cuddy Sard Scotch, but then when I got to the vessel, <laughs> they had a museum on construction, and they had truss work in a longitudinal direction. Yeah, she was composite to keep, to keep the to keep the hole straight. I'm just wondering oh, yeah. if, if you um, ran into that type of construction. Not, not in this country. Uh, uh, composite construction was uh, very popular with the British tea clippers in the uh, 1860s or 1870s. Like a transition, you had had an iron frame and wooden planking. Uh, so the transition to to all metal hulls. But essentially, the the framing. Um, uh, had diagonal strapping as well. Uh, well, this 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 had no there was no metallic structure. Oh, okay. But besides the transverse framing of courtship, it had essentially what would look like the side of a truss bridge right along the side from fore and aft on both sides. It was all strapping that was led into. Well, the it was a, it was actually yeah. a truss work. Right. Oh. Um, Independent of the side frames? Independent of the side frames, right on all sides. And actually, that was a fix, uh, as far as I'm aware. I got off of that at some point, but that was, I think that's been uh, introduced in the Constitution. Although the Constitution, they had to worry about, you know, a uh, historic site, you can't see it, kind of can't disturb any right. material. But, I just, but it, was a, it was a longitudinal wooden frame in addition to the transverse. Well, it may have been a hogging truss inside the vessel. It, that, it could have been called that. I'm just not a hogging frame. Now, that, that, that was pretty, that was very popular and a, a structural arrangement used on, uh, uh, you know, a lot of river steamers that had a shallow hull, but they needed the depth of the member, so they put a big hogging frame that was visible on, on top of the hull. Um, the, the Constitution had some structural members removed and then reinstalled about, about 10, 12 years ago. And they were... Um, how can I describe it? They were uh, heavy longitudinal uh, timbers that went from stern to bow. Uh, they just in a long sweep. They were longitudinal. They were independent of the whole frames that were inside the ceiling. Um, and they also have used laminated framing to replace the uh, frames that are deteriorated because they they can't get the, the size timbers anymore. So they've gone to laminated frames, which we you know, use in the mast. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, you know, which makes perfect sense. And you know, it's done properly under control conditions. You have an uh, excellent, excellent timber that's practically flawless. So, uh, there's a there's a uh, company upstate in um, Sydney, New York. It's called Uniland, and they uh, they've been laminating uh, structural members uh, since the 1920s. And they uh, about eight or ten years ago they laminated a um, lower cord of a bridge truss on a covered bridge up in Downsville, New York, and the laminate was. If I recall correctly, 178 feet long, uh, and I think seven feet deep and three feet wide, three or four feet wide. It was a huge member, and it was shipped in one way and, and installed in the bridge. So, uh, but it's a, you know, it's a, you know, it's a great way to, uh, you know, to build up the cross section you need without having to find good wood, which you're not going to find anymore anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, uh, yeah, she was steam powered in. Uh, oh, the shape. Oh, uh, uh, the planking was steam. Yeah, the frames were all sawn. Uh, no, we no, we had a steam box. We built a steam yeah. box on site, yeah. You know, with a few pounds of, of pressure, and uh, 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 the oak, uh, um, yeah, it was oak planking. It was about two, two and a half inch oak planking. So that was steam, 
uh, you know, depending, you know, we try to get as long lengths as possible, so we reduce the butt schedule. And uh, uh, but they were steamed, uh, you know, sometimes they steam for two hours, three hours. You know, get them out to the supple, and then you get a gang to lay them on the hull and clamp them in as quickly as you can before the thing comes off. But yeah, all all the uh, all the planking that was put on the boat was steamed, except for some short sections forward. Uh, I have one more question. Are there any current um, rules or regulations for riveted connections? Uh, you'd probably have to go back to what was acceptable in the, uh, I, I think ABS has the way of before 1968 or 69. I think there were still rules for it. ABS rules, right? so so they would be applicable if you wanted to build a little bit all, but uh, you know, the economics of that. Uh, yeah. I think of inspecting some of these uh, the old log uh, structures. How easy is it to go into them? Because uh, I, I can remember. When I was working in a shipyard, uh, going down in the double bottoms to put in a foundation back up to and whatnot, uh, and it was really very complicated. Yeah. Uh, I, I was young then, so I, <laughs> I just don't. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not doing it again. <laughs> I mean, you probably don't have young inspectors to no. be able to do that. No. Well, well, this particular vessel here. There were areas where the lightning holes in the in members were. Uh, I could just get my hand and arm and shoulder through and try to UT a portion of the bottom of the reach, and and I don't know how those guys got around it because they had to buck up the rivets to you know to work in it. And some areas you see under the engine um, foundations, uh, it, it was it was just just not possible to get in there because of the depth of the cement and then the piping so you could get so far and kind of run up against the brick wall. But, uh, you know, which is why we had these areas uh, UT gauged externally. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it, it's, uh, you know, I spend enough time on it. Do you have the other systems to work with? No, I did all this work myself. You yeah. yeah, the only helper I had was uh, on the um, um, now, I had a part-time guy with me on this vessel and on this vessel. Uh, but but everything else, you know, I've done uh, pretty much done myself. So. Take my hand off. Well, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, like I said, I'm not doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> well, certainly, uh, thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. Oh, you're very um, welcome. It's my pleasure. A small mm -hmm. share appreciation to present you with this certificate. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, thank you very much. And a uh, small gift from Sam. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.